Since the 1950s, we have dreamed of a time where machines could help eliminate the complexity and drudgery of our daily chores. Those dreams blossom from the rise of complex machines and the promise of artificial intelligence. Nowadays, AI assists with many of our daily tasks. Artificial intelligence is the study of incorporating human intelligence into machine processes. For example, by mimicking the way a human can discern a dog from the background of an image, a machine can accomplish the same task. AI tools typically consist of algorithms that perform calculations. Each AI tool can be helpful in some use cases, but not applicable to all. Developers construct accurate and useful AI tools when they use data that has been conditioned, select an appropriate algorithm for use, optimize the level of human and machine collaboration, and clearly define the task. When built upon quality data, artificial intelligence can drastically improve a person's workflow, giving them time to focus on the more important tasks. Consider a pilot flying a plane. The pilot can use the radar to determine if there will be any imminent collisions with other planes. But if constantly watching the radar, the pilot may be distracted. Collision avoidance algorithms can examine the radar data, foresee potential collisions, and warn the pilot. This relieves the pilot from constantly having to monitor the radar. Conceptually, there are two types of AI. Narrow AI refers to AI technologies that can only perform specific individual tasks such as predicting weather or identifying an object in an image. General AI is a hypothetical process where machines can fully imitate human intelligence. General AI may not emerge for decades due to its complexity. It's important to understand that although much of the excitement around AI is tied to the potential benefits of general AI, we are still in the days of narrow AI. AI fields are organized around different functions that humans can perform, such as seeing, speaking, and comprehending language. Each of these fields are then further subdivided. So the goal of AI is not to simply automate a task. It also includes delivering human-like responses and approaching problems from a human perspective to create trust in the tool. Based upon our experiences of developing AI capabilities and assessing those produced by other organizations, MIT Lincoln Laboratory describes an AI canonical architecture to discuss AI functions and workflows. First, Data is collected from sensors across various sources. This data is then conditioned, or selectively processed, to produce the best available data. Next, we select an algorithm that best suits the application, and typically we judge by the type of data we have and the type of output we need. We then select the role of the machine and the role of the human. Finally, we need to remember that the workflow should always focus on achieving the mission. When carefully considered, these components culminate in a well-built AI capability. Let's examine this architecture from the perspective of someone designing a self-driving car. Modern approaches to self-driving cars rely heavily on AI to mimic how a driver would process decisions within the driving environment. Some of the challenges that self-driving cars face are similar to those that humans face. For cars to drive autonomously, they must be able to see their environment as a human does. Self-driving cars use cameras, radar, and LIDAR sensors as data sources to detect objects, measure distances, and capture motion. Working together, these sensors provide the car a 3D view of its surrounding environment. AI systems are dependent on access to consistent and formatted data. Data format is dictated by the hardware, the messaging protocol, and the developer or manufacturer. Sensor data will most likely be in a format that is not ready to plug and play with the AI infrastructure. Thus, a key early step is to condition the data, or transform the raw data into useful information that may later be used by the algorithm. One common data conditioning technique is to normalize the data. This action aims to change numeric values to a common scale without distorting their differences, like converting data from a sensor that quantifies distance in meters to match data from another sensor that measures distance in feet. If noise is introduced into the data stream, data cleansing will be necessary. Snow and rain may obscure sensor data. A front bumper camera may fail, causing images to become blurry or non-interpretable. The data cleansing process identifies and organizes usable data while filtering out unneeded data and standardizing the remaining information. Thus, by beginning with useful data in a standardized format, we can improve the performance and accuracy of AI algorithms. Next, we consider which algorithms to implement. Choosing an algorithm for an autonomous feature depends on the sensor data format and on how independent the observations are. For example, 
Is the car tracking a new object, or is simply tracking movement of a known object? This can make a life or death difference if something appears in front of the self-driving car. When it comes to human-machine teaming, having a human in the loop is useful to handle corner cases, such as signs that have been defaced, keeping an eye on the system for when sensors break without notice, correcting unwanted behavior, such as a misaligned tire causing the car to drift, and validating appropriate behavior. Another way to look at the spectrum of human-machine collaboration is to examine the levels of automation involved in the act of driving by considering the capability of the AI system as well as the inherent risk of the activity. Low variability tasks, such as maintaining velocity, may be handled by an AI algorithm with relative ease. Many of these tasks may also be low risk. High variability tasks, such as driving in hazardous road conditions, are often better handled by humans due to our ability to generalize situations and to use intuition in decision making. As Chief Technology Director of the Nissan Research Center and former NASA scientist Martin Searhouse said, show me an autonomous system without a person in the loop and I will show you a system that is practically useless. He describes a scenario where there's road construction at an intersection. A line of cones steers traffic to the left side of the double yellow line, the traffic light is red, and a worker holds up a slow sign. The car has to interpret the cone placement and the worker's behavior to understand that it's okay to drive on the wrong side of the road and through a red light in this case. These seemingly unremarkable situations can trigger convulsions in the brain of a self-driving car. Using the seamless autonomous mobility system, when a self-driving Nissan car approaches a situation like this, it stops and sends a signal to a human operator at a call center. The operator analyzes the situation before using the car's sensors and cameras to map out the correct course of action. Control then reverts back to the AI which carries out the instructions. This information is then sent to all other nearby self-driving Nissans so that they can solve the problem without the human in the loop when they approach the same intersection. Searhouse compares this to air traffic control. There are two pilots in the cockpit, but they still need air traffic controllers. Now let's revisit these steps in greater detail, beginning with data. Many modern AI applications are built using massive data sets that are used to train the algorithms. Data is collected and conditioned for the specific task. However, there are some misconceptions about data. People often assume that data already exists. A good data collection mechanism is already in place. Data is collected at a level of fidelity that quickly answers our questions. And data is easily accessible. The starting point for any successful AI workflow is identifying the data requirements and ensuring the right data is collected. It's easy to understand how bad data can lead to unreliable answers. No matter how sophisticated the algorithms are, bad data simply leads to bad results. As previously stated, some data issues may be fixed using data conditioning, which includes detecting and correcting corrupt or inaccurate data. Real-world data is often incomplete or contains inaccuracies. AI models trained on low-quality data provide unreliable answers. Data collected for a different purpose may not provide the insights needed to complete the task. One needs to be cautious because AI algorithms will give you an answer, but not indicate how flawed it is. One good demonstration is the Huskier Wolf experiment. To investigate the degree of trust humans have in AI capabilities, University of Washington researchers sought to create a successful classifier capable of distinguishing between images of huskies and wolves that was also flawed in its training approach. The researchers tested their classifier by introducing new images of wolves and huskies. Even though huskies are very similar to wolves, the system managed to label the new images husky or wolf with approximately 90% accuracy. The results were impressive. However, after running a function capable of explaining why the algorithm managed to obtain such good results, the researchers clearly demonstrated that the model was basing its decisions primarily on image backgrounds. In both the training and the testing datasets, the pictures featuring wolves usually featured a white, snowy background, while husky images did not. So without the aid of a classifier explainer, the researchers warned that developers could unknowingly pass along an amazing snow detector. The researchers warned that model results should not be blindly trusted without reviewing the model training methodology and robustness of the training data set. Good data can also degrade in quality. Data can become too old. United Airlines used flight pattern data to gain insights into the number of airplanes needed and increase demand timeframes. 
Analysts discovered that they were overestimating potential revenue by billions of dollars because their model included irrelevant old data. Lower quality data sets often feature certain characteristics. We can attempt to improve data quality through manual evaluation and profiling the data to identify issues. We may also improve data quality by processing the data according to applicable rules. For example, to avoid errors in processing financial data, you could round every decimal value that has more than two decimal places to the nearest cent. Modern data conditioning techniques forego manual processes by letting machines automatically process data to improve its quality. Overall, the best way to increase data conditioning efficiency is to let machine learning algorithms identify new business rules and have humans correct misidentified rules. As an example, YouTube uses this approach when flagging videos with suspected inappropriate content or copyright infringement. Now let's talk about algorithms. First, AI and machine learning are similar, but not the same. As we said earlier, artificial intelligence is the study of incorporating human intelligence into machine processes. Machine learning is actually a subset of AI, where the goal is to identify patterns within data to make decisions. As described in the Husky or Wolf application, machine learning algorithms are trained on a data set where they learn how to perform their task. The algorithm uses an internal metric called a performance criterion to measure its performance and then recalibrates to improve performance. Machine learning algorithms generally require a lot of data to make accurate predictions. If the data is of low quality or if there's insufficient data, the model's performance will be unreliable. Let's examine the three types of machine learning algorithms. Supervised learning relies on labeled data to train algorithms on a way to predict the labels for an unforeseen data set. And there are two supervised learning applications. The goal of classification is to predict a discrete set of classes or labels for an object. For instance, when trained on a set of images featuring either a cat or a dog, a supervised learning algorithm predicts whether a new picture contains a cat or a dog. In regression, we could use supervised learning to predict a continuous variable, such as the travel time between two locations. For example, given all of the possible routes between Boston and New York, and the time it takes to traverse each segment throughout the day, Google Maps uses supervised learning to estimate the current travel time or predict future estimates. In both classification and regression, supervised learning algorithms take labeled training data to build a model, which then predicts the label for test data it has never seen before. Let's go into more detail about one of the more well-known supervised learning algorithms. A neural network is a computing system inspired by the human brain and is composed of various components. Nodes are akin to the neurons found in a brain. All layers are simply collections of neurons. Nodes and layers are connected in various ways, and these connections are like the axons that carry messages between neurons in the brain. The functions and weights can be viewed as nodal and connection settings that may be changed to improve model performance. The input layer receives data. The output layer produces the model's final results. Layers that exist between the input and output layer are called hidden layers. A neural network with more than one hidden layer is called a deep neural network, which enables the neural net to approximate more complex functions. The neural network learns by producing an output based upon a set of inputs, comparing its output to a desired output, and attempting to decrease its overall error rate. It improves by doing this learning process many times using a diverse data set. Neural networks have proven in multiple applications to produce very accurate results. However, this comes at a cost, lots of training data. Neural networks can also be quite large, driving higher computer memory and processing requirements. The most basic neural network design is the feed-forward neural network, in which input data only flows in one direction across the network. Thus, data enters at the input layer, flows through any hidden layers, and results in an output at the output layer. Though the input data only flows in one direction, the error results pass back through the model, and the nodal weights are updated to minimize error for future predictions. This process, called backpropagation, is what allows the network to learn. There are several different neural network variants, each with their own strength. Let's take a look at a few. Convolutional neural networks are very useful for image classification. A convolutional neural network is a type of feed-forward neural network that interprets each region of an image separately by convoluting or sliding a filter across the image, aggregating small spatial regions together. For example, in our Husky or Wolf classifier, a feed-forward neural network would produce a classification by interpreting the entire image at once, but a convolutional neural network 
could interpret image features, curves, shapes, color changes separately. The advantage of viewing the image by region is that the convolutional neural network learns what a dog looks like regardless of where that dog is in the image. Recurrent neural networks are very useful for speech recognition applications. A recurrent neural network has input data flowing across the network layers like a feed-forward model, but it also reintroduces segments of past information, like a feedback loop, to better understand the present. This provides a temporal quality to the process, which, in effect, offers the model a memory. For instance, each time a user attempts to invoke hands-free control of their mobile device using a short trigger phase like Hey Siri or Alexa, the device is applying this recurrent approach to determine if the user actually said the trigger phrase. Deep belief networks introduce a novel training concept that minimizes problems in backpropagation and offers good results based upon smaller training sets. Let's return to our self-driving car example. We would like to use machine learning to recognize the car's surroundings. We have a set of images from the onboard camera, and we would like to identify what objects are present and where they are located within the images. This goal can be broken down into three tasks. Image interpretation is a data projection step, which identifies the location of all of the objects and provides a representation of those objects. Label prediction identifies what each object is, with both the car and the objects moving, we would like to track those objects over time. Unsupervised learning derives hidden structures from unlabeled data. The goal of unsupervised learning is to discover interesting information about the data itself. To do this, unsupervised learning uses two general approaches. The goal of clustering is to find clusters or similar groupings within the data. As you would expect, items in a cluster are similar to each other in some way, and different from items in other clusters. There are a variety of clustering algorithms available, and the proper choice depends on the shape of the data. For some algorithms, the number of clusters needs to be estimated before the training the model. For others, the model will estimate the number of clusters while learning. As an example, an algorithm using a clustering technique is presented with a data set of pictures featuring the faces of six unidentified people. A well-tuned clustering algorithm should evaluate the data features and divide the pictures into six distinct clusters, where each cluster contains photos of the same person. The goal of data projection is to maximize the available information found within the data. One approach is to use principal component analysis to reorient the data in a way that maximizes the differences within the data. This exposes differences between data features and allows classifications to be made more easily. Principal component analysis, along with non-negative matrix factorization and scaling, are also used to condition the data for other machine learning algorithms. The advantages of applying unsupervised learning are that unlabeled data are abundant and the algorithms do not have to rely on human experts to label the data. One downside to unsupervised learning is that it may not provide useful information. For instance, in grouping pictures featuring six distinct people, the algorithm may create six clusters but may base the groupings on the background color instead of facial features. The algorithm has no truth source to determine how it should be grouping. Reinforcement learning places an algorithm within a well-defined interactive environment where the algorithm attempts to choose actions that result in obtaining the highest reward. The algorithm uses trial and error as well as feedback from the environment to identify the next suitable action as it attempts to achieve the highest reward. The most well-known examples of reinforcement learning are those in which an algorithm learns to play a board game, say chess or Go. In reinforcement learning, the learner is active and constantly interacts with the environment. At a given time, the algorithm finds itself in a specific state and takes action. As the world state changes, information is given to the algorithm and it selects its next action. There are two types of reinforcement learning. In model-free reinforcement learning, the algorithm only knows which actions are good and which actions are bad in a given state. In model-based reinforcement learning, the algorithm has learned a model of the environment and knows how the world changes. Reinforcement learning can handle complex tasks. For example, an algorithm can learn to make certain moves based on the aggression policy or the value of the pieces to help shape a course of action. Let's consider how a self-driving car may employ reinforcement learning. Reward functions are encoded in the car's driving rules in order to keep the car in the center of the lane, enable safe passing maneuvers, and selecting the optimal route. The algorithm can support lane assist by keeping the vehicle between the lines while moving. The algorithm applies that data with these rules to make decisions. 
For example, the decisions made during a successful lane change become training based on reward functions. AI deals with tasks that a human can perform. However, these tasks are still monitored by humans for their performance and productivity. This is the framework of human-machine collaboration. This approach details how computer can complement, augment, or replace humans in accomplishing certain tasks. The concept of artificial intelligence is grounded in this idea of designing computers that are able to augment humans by responding and operating in an increasingly human fashion. The spectrum of collaboration spans from computers not being involved with a task to computers autonomously completing the entire task. In a machine augmenting human situation, a computer can extend the human's ability or compensate for less than perfect decision making. Using a car's computer for lane assist, where the computer gently nudges the car toward the appropriate lane, is such an example. In collaborative machine, a computer can relieve the human of some tasks, while the human concentrates on others. One example of this is cruise control, which allows the driver to watch the road without worrying about maintaining the car's speed. In human augmenting machine situations, a human can give insight to the computer. When using cruise control, the human can override the cruise control by pressing the gas pedal. Once the gas pedal is released, cruise control takes back control over the car's speed. At the far right of the spectrum, a computer can replace a human when the task is too dull or fatiguing, such as a self-driving car requiring no assistance. Let's take a look at how AI components contribute to the mission. For the self-driving car, a successful mission entails navigating the real-world path in a timely manner while avoiding or adapting to high-risk incidents. To accomplish this mission, developers need to not only account for a wide range of weather conditions and poor visibility, but also moving objects, particularly ones that present high risk. Thus, using robust sensors that deliver high-quality data is important. Developers need to determine an optimal route to complete the mission, so performing data conditioning techniques on traffic records and possible routing would be necessary. Developers need to properly select any algorithms used to ensure success. For instance, employing a recurrent neural network may be appropriate when detecting moving objects due to the temporal aspect of object trajectories. Finally, developers need to design the system to account for times that the car may be in control and under which conditions the human must take over. While AI can be very useful, it does have limitations. Good data is required for good models, while bad data produces bad models. One must remember that poorly defined problems do not lend themselves to AI. This means that if you don't know what problem you're trying to solve, the AI won't know. AI solutions are rarely plug and play. Most models will require tuning, and those that don't will have considerable limitations. It is also worth noting that academia uses well-defined toy problems that may not adhere well to the real world. But if a problem has good data and is well-defined, it can usually be solved with AI. Additionally, machine learning may require specialized hardware. It is important to carefully choose inputs and outputs. Many models could be applied to your problem, depending on how your data is structured, so you have to be conscious of your end goal. Training methods are what make hard problems doable. Choosing the right loss functions can greatly improve performance. While neural networks are not always needed, good training is. There are open source and commercial tools and libraries available for implementing AI. You will need to ensure that you can use them in your development environment. We hope that this short presentation has provided a deeper insight into artificial intelligence, not only at a slightly more technical level than what you may have been previously introduced, but also in a relatable context.